and thank you for joining us on another episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. I am your host, Sharifa Hardy, and today is a great show. We got started a little bit later because we've been having such a wonderful conversation. It was hard <laughs> for us to stop that conversation and to bring you into the conversation, but that's what we're going to do. And I know this show is going to be so amazing that you want all of your friends to take part. You want your friends to be a part of this conversation. So I'm going to do what I always ask you to do, and that is to go bother somebody. That's right. Go bother them. They're trying to have peace, quiet, sleep, rest. We will have none of that. It's time for them to wake up, get up, and join us on the show. So share the show, tweet the show, text the show, inbox someone, send them an email, a carrier pigeon, whatever it is you have to do, a smoke signal, but let them know that the Roundtable Talk Show is live because friends don't let friends miss out on the Roundtable Talk Show. So while you're sharing, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first guest and I might get a little bit of, of advice at the same time because our first guest is known for giving out the best advice. Advice Sister Allison, who is a writer, a photographer, an advice columnist, and so much more. Good morning, Allison Blackman. How are you? Good morning, Sharifa. I'm just great. I'm so glad to be on your show. I'm so glad to have you. I love people who give great advice because one of my biggest problems, biggest, like biggest problems is everyone's like, I don't know, ask Sharifa. I don't know, ask Sharifa. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to ask Allison. <laughs> Thank you, Sharifa. I've been giving advice online since about 1997, and my website, advicesisters.com, was one of the very first online to give advice mostly to women, but we have a lot of men who like it too, because it's it's pretty no-nonsense. I'm, I'm less, hey, girlfriend, and more, ask yourself this question. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Love so it. you said you, you know, because I built my first website in 1994. So I've watched a lot. I've seen a lot. I'm just curious, what are some, what made you decide to go online back in the 90s and start an advice column? Well, I started out doing bulletin boards for a career site. And I had a column called Ask Allison. And people were asking me questions from all over the world. And I realized anyone can give advice. Anyone to your friend, to your mother, or whatever. But when it comes to people you don't know around the world, it's a skill. I'm sure some of the other panelists would agree that you really have to not tell people what to do, but direct them through the forest, through the trees. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was good at it. And so we, my sister and I, we started out, we were twins. We started out writing advice books, mostly on love and dating and weddings and you know, relationships. And um, after she passed away, which she did, sadly, I continued oh. because my readers said, we really don't want you to stop. So that's, so I've been doing it ever since. And Advice Sisters Now is more a kind of a lifestyle website. My other advice column, which is Leather and Lace Advice for Adults, but not Porn, is with <laughs> him. And we, we share his and her questions. So I just did it because I had gotten into it early and I love helping people, but I'm not a doctor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I give, I've gotten my experience from the School of Hard Knocks. Mm -hmm. I went there too. I went there. Yes. I went, what class? I walked with me. <laughs> I've been online a long time. Like, what graduation class was you? What year did you graduate? <laughs> but I want to go back because we skimmed completely over. We tried to just, ooh, no, let's go back to the leather and lace. Like, <laughs> What is, what is that about? It was big. My husband loves Stevie Nicks, and it's based on a, on a Stevie Nicks song called Leather and Lace, mm -hmm. um, which kind of says, if you look at it, um, that male and female give to each other and kind of meld in different ways. So I may, it's provocative, but the, the mo we do have a spice section mm -hmm. that's really just for adults. But the rest of it, I mean, most people ask the same questions over and over. I gave him a gift. And I didn't get one back. You know, what does this mean? Or, you know, I said, I love you. And he didn't say, I love you. Or, you know, she gave me a horrible sweater and now do I have to wear it? <laughs> so, I mean, there are questions that everybody has, but we try to answer them with the other side's playbook. So 
my, my uh, co-author, Anthony Sabatini, answers like as men do. And I answer, I think, with a more kind of emotional approach. And people get two for one. But it's not porn. <laughs> it's not porn. <laughs> Does it say that on the website? Does it say leather and lace, not porn? Like, are, do you make that clear? <laughs> it says leatherandlaceadvice.com. And, and as I say, we have a little section that's spice if you really want to know about menage a trois and other questions like that. But you can stay away from that. Um, it is a, a site for people who are, I guess, teenagers and above. You know, it's okay. not. Now, I have an odd question. And usually when I have an odd question, it's just really because I like to ask people just off the wall questions. And I want to ask this question, but I also don't want to put this idea in your head if it's not already there. But as an advice columnist, do you ever suffer from imposter syndrome? I'm not sure I know what you mean by imposter syndrome. Uh, if you mean do do I worry about other people doing it? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. And some people have capitalized on my name, which I quickly squelch. Mm -hmm. um, as far as me being an imposter, I mean, I'm the genuine article. I've been doing this for decades. And I never say that this is a, a substitute for professional help. Mm -hmm. This is something to get you started. And my advice for the most part is free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know. No, Would let me, I guess, make the question a little bit specific. And only reason is because sometimes when we reach a certain level and we're in certain roles or certain titles or certain positions, imposter syndrome comes in and we look at it and go, who am I to give this advice? Who am I to tell people what to do? Who am I to tell people what not yeah, to do? Yeah. And that's why I didn't want to introduce that idea, you know, okay. if it wasn't there. I think, I think this is true for everyone that mm -hmm. you have to start somewhere and People who are professionals learn it by experience. They either go to school or they're doing it over and over and over and over. I have probably answered, I mean, thousands of questions all over the world. I worked for a Taiwanese magazine, an Indian magazine, um, one in um, Australia, and our cultures are different. So, you know, you have to learn as you go along what the cultures are and how to deal with them. But again, my advice is not so much dump the bum, you know, <laughs> more like, you know, if he's been in jail for three years and had four wives and beat them all, do you really want to marry him? You know, <laughs> so I don't feel, I, I do not feel like an imposter. I feel mm -hmm. that I'm a, an advice columnist. I mean, Anne and Abby didn't go to school either. You know, mm -hmm. and they fought with each other. So mm -hmm. I don't know how good their relationships were. So the answer is, not for me. I mean, I'm the genuine article at this point. But again, I do not say this is professional. You know, I'm not a psychologist, a doctor, or a psychiatrist. And people know that when they're asking. And, and you could take my advice or not. You're not, you know, the world won't be any different, except maybe for you. If you know what I mean. <laughs> No, but I love that answer. I just, because I was curious because I, you know, people always ask Sharifa, ask Sharifa, ask Sharifa. And I kind of give the same disclaimer. Like I have absolutely no degrees. I don't have degrees in anything. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. I can only tell you the world according to Sharifa, but right. I've been doing this for over 25 years. I, I <laughs> consult as far as business. So I can tell you what I've seen work. I can tell you what I've experienced. But again, like you said, it's up to you to take um, the advice. Do you ever do columns on individuals or people or businesses or brands? Yes. I mean, on advicesisters.com, I do profiles also on leather and lace. We've done a, done a number of profiles. Um, most of what I write is either reviews of something, which people have come to see are, are fair and reasonable, or I'm writing something that's personal. For instance, I'm writing a column now called Things to be Happy About. We're up to number 12, and when COVID-19 started, I was unhappy. And I mm -hmm. thought, okay, if I share with my, I, and everything I was getting pitched was, COVID-19 and everyone's going to die. And the news was so dire, I thought, you know, I'm going to start another column. And I'm mm -hmm. just going to put something every week about what I'm grateful for. And then I asked other people to do it too. So I've get, gotten experts from everywhere and just ordinary people, sort of like you, you know, calling them from interesting people. And, you know, they've shared what makes them, you know, happy during this time, which is not such a happy time for people. 
Well, that's wonderful. So definitely, if you're interested in expanding your column, I would love to be a part of it. But the next one. <laughs> I would love to be in the next one. But also, you might be interested in our next guest, who is an excellent resource for a reporter or a journalist. And he focuses on in financial empowerment, Mr. Brian Haney. Good morning, Brian. How are you? Hey, Sharifa. Thanks for having me. I love your backdrop. You are so welcome. What, <laughs> what is this in the red? So that's our logo. logo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's it's a it's a significant part of our company brand that has a personal component to it. So um, you know, the the short, short, short version is as as a company, we're the Haney Company, which is a family-owned and operated financial practice in the Washington, DC area, not too far away from Philosophy. So um, we uh, it's my my father, myself, and my brother uh, are the three kind of principles. And as we were working through our branding, you mentioned that earlier, um, and really kind of doing a redesign, part of the questions that we were asking ourselves was, you know, what are some of these core qualities we want to be known for as a company? Because that's important. You know, sometimes it's not just about what you do, what you deliver, but the things that are valuable to you and what you, what your identity is, uh, kind of your ethos, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these words like loyalty, extremely caring, kind of funny but in a good way and we started to look at that and we we're like you know like we might want to consider a mascot uh -huh. which again it's a financial company a mascot like none of that stuff made any sense but as we went down this branding rabbit hole we actually realized why not like that's a great a that makes us stand out considerably from any other financial practice like ours um, and B, the reason for it was because there was a lot, you know, the A, Bulldog's the number one mascot in America. I don't, most people don't even know that, but if you think about it, you know, you'll think of Bulldog's galore now that I'm talking about it. Um, and as a family, we have Bulldogs, we have English Bulldogs. So we had a live subject for mascot development and all this other stuff. And actually that is, the image uh, was developed by our, our family and the English Bulldog and so it's just, it's cool that it all kind of came together, but that's, um, you know, and I, and I love, you know, now as somebody that's, uh, you know, tries to be an advocate in the financial industry to help other professionals, I do a lot of times I speak on branding and digital development, and this is part of the conversation that I have is, you know, well, you know, the things that I think a lot of times get missed are, you know, what is it about you that has nothing to do with what you deliver as a professional? And how can you let that come out more so that way public can get to know you and and figure out what makes you tick and and find those synergies i'm sure allison you know can appreciate that i'm sure uh, renee can as well because you know people don't buy my stuff they buy me exactly. so it was it's always been important for us as a practice to allow that to come out uh as much as anything else so that was a long-winded answer to a, what should have been a very easy question, but thanks for asking. It's a, <laughs> no, I love long, I, keep, I told you guys backstage, I love long-winded. People always get nervous. They're like, I'm rambling. I'm like, no, rambling is good. At, the, at about nine o'clock, believe me, I'll come in here and I'm like, well, thank you for tuning in. <laughs> thank you for being a guest because so the reason I started all of this is because I always want to know the story behind the business. That's, that's what I love, you know, because I think it's so much that we can all learn from because being in business, you, you have challenges, you have ups, you have downs. And so if I can use my challenges to say, you know what, Brian, if you do this in your business, you may, avo you may avoid this challenge. Or if you do this, then you will be more successful. So I love to learn so I can tell everyone, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And that's what I was talking about um, earlier with Allison is those experience that help us all. But I did have a question and sure. I'm a total sidebar before this, but this is why I tell people prior to the show, they're like, what questions are you going to ask? I'm like, I don't know. Like I just, whatever comes to me and it's, uh, it's from the conversation. Come back Can to I my ask Ryan what his dog's names are? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, um, so the the dog that was behind the mascot, uh, his name was Indy. He's one of we've had three. So uh, the first English bulldog our family had, my parents had them at, at their at their place, uh, was named Bruno, uh, and he passed many years ago. Indy sadly passed last year, um, but currently we have a nine month old 
who has who is now the largest bulldog we've ever had because he's a tank uh and his name is otis so we, we are never without a mascot his name has changed but we still have that persona uh and and our fingers are crossed the first two you know like we do uh trade shows and we go places oh, wow. a lot um and so having a it, it would always be nice to actually have the dog with us in like a booth or a trade show or whatever. The first two, not socially adept enough for that to be a good idea. Uh, you know, we want to get invited back kind of thing. Uh, our fingers are crossed right now. We think Otis could could actually be socially engaging enough to not uh, ruin it for, for the rest of us. He's pretty, I mean, he's just the most affectionate scaredy cat i mean he's huge <laughs> but like you look at him weird and he'll just be like oh so it's it's just it's it's a barrel of fun um you know and having this be a part of our practice uh we have um it's like you see us at a trade show we have this big backdrop and the big picture is our bulldog and i i gotta say it's it's great as a brand mm -hmm. with with one caveat exception is that 20 percent of the people that will come visit us We'll just want to talk about bulldogs have nothing to do with what we do professionally. And again, I, I love it. It's it's fun because obviously we have no problem talking about it, but it's still it's kind of like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we should have thought about that, but you know, it's, that's what we're doing. We're spending this time speaking about the bulldog. We have yeah, to guide yeah, you to hey, your business. You know. So this is interesting, but from a brand perspective, sure. um, and you mentioned the dogs were nice, they're wonderful, but not everyone sees dogs or bulldogs as nice and gentle. So when you think of a brand, they may see your brand or see you, you know, as a company, as someone that's aggressive or, you know, did that thought, did you ever consider that in your branding? Well, um, we did, we did. And, you know, we did, all, and so in, in, complete full disclosure we did a ton of research um as hopefully anybody that's going through some side of some kind of a, a brand dynamic would do um and and considered a lot of those things um the majority of the data that we found showed that people had a, a very positive um outlook on on a bulldog not necessarily all dogs obviously etc um and you know, so so while you'll you'll have that issue and you can run into that, I think in probably any type of a situation, um, we still felt pretty good. You know, we looked at you know things like unbelievably loyal, caring, compassionate, funny, fun, like all, a lot of the things where you know we were looking at the statistical correlation between these identity words and these these connection words that made a lot of sense for us as people and also correlated and corresponded with what people saw in a bulldog and we just kind of said you know what like we're gonna we're you can't dip your toe in the in the in the mascot water you got to jump in with both feet so we jumped in haven't looked back since and thankfully even though you, you mentioned i don't think we've had somebody misinterpret it or, or I, at least and maybe they they saw it had a reaction and we never engaged with them i haven't i haven't had to overcome something like that um but it is it's a great conversation piece and mm -hmm. we enjoy it uh tremendously so yeah. okay see i think i'm introducing ideas in the air this morning and i don't know where where they're coming from i just like to ask questions we haven't even begun to to discuss your business and financial empowerment tell us a little bit about that ask me brian Sure. So I, I tell everybody I, I do one thing. I help people make the financial decisions that they want to make, but they just don't know how to. Mm -hmm. uh, so financial empowerment for me really looks like something very similar to I know what Allison, Renee, uh, Felicity do. It's helping people work through all of the competing information that's out there. And with Google, that amount of stuff that's out there that you got to figure out has only, you know, quadrupled in the last five to 10 years and just and then also connect with you on a personal level because it's you know the emo the the emotions behind making decisions play a huge role mm -hmm. so financial and financial anything is not an intellectual process mm -hmm. i would love to say that it is that we just all have this internal mechanism that adds up numbers in our head and then we just very you know, statistically and, and deterministically make these decisions. That's not how it works. 
Um, so I, you know, I, I spend a lot of time making sure that I understand where you come from, what your values are, how do you see finances in general, um, what what represents a win to you, what doesn't, uh, and I think that that's, I mean, that's our value proposition. I think, you know, working with you that way, then you're empowered to be able to make this decision that up till this point until we were able to sort through all of that was just a mystery and then something that you felt bad about, right? When we, when we know we should do something and we don't, we feel bad. Mm -hmm. So I think the real empowerment isn't just executing on some sort of a financial uh, transaction or piece. I think it's really um, that the, the feelings that people then have uh, when it comes to, you know, I, I've been trying to do this for years and now you finally helped me do this. So I think, I think I'm in the human transformation business uh, mm -hmm. and it's a fun thing to be able to do. That's wonderful. And we want to talk a little bit more about finances, financial education. I want to introduce our next guest, Felicide. You're also in um, finances. You're a financial consultant. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Sharifa. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. I love, I just, I'm so inquisitive. I just love backgrounds and backdrops and what's going on in the, in the back. Let's take a look at some of these pictures. Are those you in the photos? Um, yes, I need, yeah, they're all me. <laughs> I can see from here. I mean, those are unique. Those are artistic. I love it. It's beautiful. But again, I seem to have gone off in a different direction. We were discussing you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Well, I'm Falasha Day, the accountability accountant. I help entrepreneurs and individuals live their dreams. So I help entrepreneurs utilize their accounting and use it to leverage and grow their businesses. Mm -hmm. And I do that, Sharifa, by incorporating three things into their life. I incorporate the accounting, which is a tough part into their businesses. The accountability is the part that kills people the most. I incorporate that. And then I coach them to be able to make the six and seven figures that they're destined to make. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the favorite part, the accountability, because that's the part that most people, like you said, um, suffer with. That's the, the hard part for me, because I, I tell people, and I've said it many times on the show, like I, I can create the best plans and I can come up with the best strategies, but to actually commit to it and to actually do it is usually because of the accountability. Would you talk to us a little bit more about that, please? You know what, Sharifa, a few years ago, I, I was originally the, um, the entrepreneur's accountant when I first came online to really expand and grow my company. And so my brand manager was like, well, Ashade, you're everybody know you do accounting for entrepreneurs. You're the accountability accountant. You hold people accountable to do what they say that they're going to do. And so what I realized, and then after that clear moment, God started to make it very clear in my message. And I realized that if we lack accountability, we are actually going to prevent ourselves from achieving our goals so without accountability there's no execution mm -hmm. without accountability there's no precision without accountability there's no sales without accountability there's no business mm -hmm. um so i start to see the direct correlation between accountability and our accounting and mm -hmm. without accountability most people don't do their accounting. They don't have accounting, especially in my community, the African-American community. So um, the accountability plays a major key role in the success that most of uh, the people that everyone watches, um, one of the major qualities that they possess is being able to be held accountable. And I like how absolutely. I'm just curious actually for Brian too, we're in the advice business, but you're dealing with people's finances. I just deal with their hearts. <laughs> How do you get people to trust you <laughs> with their money and with your advice when it's financial advice? Alasa, do you want to take that? Can you hear me still? We can hear you, Brian. I think your screen is, is, is frozen, but I can okay. hear you. Mine froze for a minute too. Yeah, I, I, I'm my Zoom's still working at least audio wise, but it's uh, it, my video's off. Um, for me, it, it's really I think um, 
when people can see, know, and understand who I am, both as a person, a person of value, and then as a professional, um, I think that's a lot of where that decision making comes into play. I think we look for fits, right? Things that, is there a synergy in the way that, um, you know, I approach something that, that, you know, whoever it is that I'm going to be working with finds is valuable and, and synchronizes with their decision making process. So I think that that probably plays the largest role. I'm not, a, and I, I always tell everybody, I'm not a fit for everybody. And so usually in an initial meeting, if it looks like we aren't in sync or there, there isn't a fit or the way that I approach things doesn't jive with what you're looking for. then I always tell every person that's a prospect at that point, it's okay to tell me no. Um, because yeah. I'd rather yeah. you work with somebody that's the right fit for you than for us to, you know, fit a square peg in a round hole just because, you know, you like me, you found me online or whatever. So I think to me, it's much that, you know, I've got a, a ton of professional designations that help demonstrate my credibility, but I think it's always that, you know, what's the best fit? Uh, and let's, let's be honest about, are we in sync or are we not? That's, that's what works for me. And sorry, go ahead, Felicity. I'm going to try to see if I can get my, uh, I mean, that's the same for me as well. So I just, I agree with you on this. Not everyone's going to love you in this world, but hopefully a lot. Will. Everyone loves me. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, they don't. They don't. Believe, believe me, they what don't. About you? What about you? Because you have a community that maybe is not as used to financial advisors. I'm not sure if that's true, but you know. Was that question Are you referring to me, me Allison? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So with me, I've been able to uh, build trust in two ways. Number one way was exactly what Brian mentioned was the brand development. Um, I've been a content creator for years now, not as long as you, right, <laughs> but for a long period of time online. So I've been able to build uh, credibility and build trust in that manner. But most importantly, what I do, I meet my clients exactly where they are. So if there's, if they're the millionaire client, I meet them exactly where they are. If they're the client that comes from dysfunction, like I came from, um, without having any uh, uh, connection to financial literacy, I meet them exactly where they are. And I try to make it as easy as um, less uh, convoluted as possible. And so by doing that, that allows them to let go of the different layers that they built up in terms of developing that hate against numbers and that hate against um, the um, accounting part of the business. So that's, I think, how I've been able to do it, Allison. I think, I think that's it's wonderful. Sweet experience, you know, mm -hmm. long enough. All of us have done it long enough that, you know, you, you, can, show, you can prove that you're worthy it's just a question of getting, I think, the right fit, as Brian said, too. Absolutely. So now I, I tell people, not only is this a roundtable discussion, but this is my daily therapy session. It gives me an opportunity to speak to everyone and get some of these thoughts off. But I definitely out. I definitely want to bring in our next guest, Renee Exelbert. She is actually a psychologist as well as a certified personal trainer. Good morning, Renee. How Good are you? Morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And it's so nice to meet all of you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for joining us. You've been so patient. You've been just waiting for your moment because we get to talking sometimes and um, that's just kind of how it happens. But from a psych, we talked about a couple of things. I want to go back to the imposter syndrome for a minute and I would love your perspective as far as um, from a psychologist and then we'll get into what you do. But I noticed that many successful people, they get to a certain level and some of them not even most of them, not all of them, but they suffer from imposter syndrome to where they feel like, you know, I, I came from dysfunction, as Philosophy was saying, or I came from a broken home, or I came from a poor family, or I came from this, I don't have degrees, I don't have that, so who am I? And they may not feel worthy to sit in those positions. Do you have any thoughts on that, Renee? I do. I think that those are people's gifts. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I, I teach students at NYU um, and many of them talk about how they don't have their degree yet or they don't have a lot of experience or they come from dysfunction. And I always say that those are the things that we bring to the table. So if uh, somebody comes from dysfunction, they are going to be able to connect with somebody else who comes from dysfunction, who may be intimidated by somebody who doesn't come from dysfunction. We all come from some, some level of dysfunction. I don't know what normal is. But I think that, um, are you getting feedback from? Yeah, uh, sorry, I just, I just corrected it. You correct, wonderful. So <laughs> I think that um, everything that we go through in our lives brings us um, to different people, right? And I think that all of our hardships and our obstacles are indeed, as I said, gifts, um, mm -hmm. and use them to connect with people that we wouldn't have been able to connect with had we not gone through those obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, they allow us uh, a way to see lots of different perspectives. They allow us to connect with people who um, want to grow. Um, and so this idea of being an imposter, I think that um, it's really important that we embrace who we are, where we come from, um, become vulnerable with our struggles, and put it out there to the world. We're having fun this morning. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> okay, so I, I don't know, because I was having a conversation about that the other day, and so it was on the top of my mind, so I wanted to discuss it. But what I thought was interesting about you and your bio was you are a certified personal trainer, and you're also a psychologist, which I mentioned earlier, but often when we want to get in shape, or often when we want to get fit and healthy, you know, and get maybe that ideal weight goal, we, off, we often don't take a look at our mental blocks at our mindset in order to be to be able to get in shape the way we want to so it's beautiful to be able to combine the body and the mind so i love what you do thank you um i love what i do too they're my two babies um and they came about from very personal experience i've been a psychologist uh for 20 years um because i'm only 29 um so you know, it's a few years <laughs> but um I, I had breast cancer in 2007 um, and when you have cancer or you go through some sort of chronic illness, you feel like your body betrays you. And so the one way that I felt more in control of my body uh, was through exercise and nutrition. And I got really into exercise um, and I became uh, a personal trainer. I also became a figure competitor where I stood on stage in my bikini and stripper heels and I flexed my muscles, something I would never imagine that I would do. Mm -hmm. um, and I now have a center called the Metamorphosis Center for Psychological and Physical Change, and I integrate psychotherapy and exercise. Um, so it's a very mind body experience. Um, people generally come to me with all sorts of different life issues. Um, it can be anything, but I often see um, a, a connection between the mind and body. Uh, mm -hmm. So if I'm working with a kid who's being bullied, um, not only do I think it's really important to talk about their self-esteem and the things that they're struggling with, but also incorporate you know, physical exercise and the visual imagery about becoming strong. When you say that you incorporate psychotherapy into the session what does that look like when somebody comes to work with you what actually happens so um my office is this crazy crazy eclectic place where it's half gym and half stodgy psychotherapy office mm -hmm. um, but uh for instance i was recently working with a woman who was in an extremely competitive uh world for many many years um, a business and uh, she kind of felt like she lost her soul mm -hmm. um, and she left that, that uh, job. And so um, in addition to talking about her experience and talking about her identity, we will go over to the bench press and she will literally like put the uh, weights near her chest and I will have her envision um, her core, like mm -hmm. holding the, the weights to her chest. And it's different for each person, but I'll have her envision um, what's at her core or where she, even where she is now, the negativity in her job. And then we will do exercises like a chess fly. And as she's doing a chess fly, it's about expanding, right? And so the psychology of it is 
not only just talking about where she wants to go in her life and how she can expand as a person, right? Or grow as a person, but physically connecting that imagery with like where she is and what she's been through and how she's going to literally open up and where she wants to go. And it's very, very powerful um, when you're, you know, not only moving in that direction each day in therapy or each week in therapy, but combining it in a very physical, visual way. It's really quite beautiful and very powerful. Um, I can tell. It sounds like it. what I imagined when you said that was um, like mantras, like while they're working out a lot of mantras, like mm -hmm. you mentioned the lady doing the expanding, like if there were mantras while they were doing the workout. So that was very interesting. I want to go back over to Allison for a minute. Um, you have two sites. You have the um, okay. Advice okay. Sisters. I have three, actually. I have Advice okay. Sisters. I have Leather and Lace Advice. And I have one called My Gilded Life, which is in production. And it has been for two years because I've just been too busy. But that's going to be more like, a, I think people want to see more of me, mm -hmm. unless it's just advice. Or, so that's where I'm going to let it all hang out. <laughs> Once what I get it. What are some of the things you're going to share about your life? Well, first of all, I started Advice Sisters with my twin sister. And if you know anything about twins, she was my best friend, my business partner, my book co-author, because we've written a number of books together, my, just my best friend as well. And so she died at 48 and she literally dropped dead. So that's the elephant in the room. No, um, she wasn't really sick. I don't know exactly what happened. We were in People Magazine, the new Anne and Abby, and we were getting famous. And she died drinking coffee in bed. That's the shocker. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> I know, and it was a while ago, but I mean, that has really shaped my life because now I'm learning to be a twin without a twin. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really kind of difficult, mm -hmm. um, but I still see her kind of in my head thinking, what would she say? Because we mm -hmm. always do this, the same thing I'm doing with Tony Sabatini, which is a head and a heart kind of answer. So there are always two answers for one. So I think mm -hmm. the most important thing about me is that I am a twin without a twin now. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I, I just, I mean, I had a nice upbringing. Um, I went to college, I got a master in public administration, which I really haven't used very much, but it taught me how to think. And I think that's why I'm good at what I do, because I don't look at what my own personal socioeconomic and political or whatever values are. I try to think in a general term, you know, what would, what would this person need? And everybody's emotions around the world are the same. I mean, heartbreak's heartbreak, for instance, but it's handled differently. I mean, you know, what we wrote for Chai Time, which was an Indian dating site, would be very different from what I would do in Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. because you know, the, the culture is very different. So you have to be mindful of that. And I, as, as uh, everyone's been saying, it's as you grow and you learn about yourself, all that experience, every heartbreak you have, and I'm also a cancer survivor, mm -hmm. um, every heartbreak you have makes you not just stronger, but I hope wiser. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love the sentiment uh, that that heartbreak is, is is shared, right? I think that we are much more similar than we are different as as human beings, um, and we all connect with pain. And back to what you know, Brian was talking about earlier, right? Like this emotional and everybody, right? This this emotional connection to our investments, right? Coming from dysfunction, people connect with people and and we are we're much more the same than we are different right but we handle it differently for instance yeah. on, on chai time which is a dating site we couldn't say dating we would have to say marriage partner because mm. many people are still making arranged marriages that's just one little little thing but um culture is very different and where you come from is very very different and where i sit is not the same as everyone else in the world and everyone's unique so our emotions are the same, but how we would choose to solve a problem is very different. Absolutely. Yeah. So we need someone like Brian. Brian, you with us? Have Brian. <laughs> we, we, we're going to get Brian here somewhere. We have two of Brian. I, I just saw him again. I'm back. Ryan, we missed you. <laughs> I, I, I had to, I, I couldn't get it to unfreeze. 
And even though I could hear everybody fine, it was bothering the heck out of me. So I got it on my phone so I could get off. So you knew I wasn't going anywhere. I'm back. We're good. Yeah, it's not a that thing. I'm, I'm literally, I'm hardline plugged in. So it's not a Wi-Fi issue. Sorry about that. No, it's okay because we we do what we do. We continue the conversation, but we're now back to you, back to your your business and your questions. But with financial empowerment, are there any specific strategies or um, tips that you can provide to anyone as far as you know what they can do? You know, I think um, like exercise, like therapy, um, life change. Financial, you know, I mean, all, I'm sure everybody on this on this uh, live session will nod your head when you reg- recognize what I'm about to say. Finances is probably one of the highest, most stressful things that we all deal with. It's it's the number one reason couples fight, right? It's the number one reasons why businesses fail. It goes on and on. So, you know, to me. I, I'm, I'm acutely aware of, of the fact that it's really not about money. It's about a lot of other things and money just happens to be that kind of that focal point that we can point to. But so that's a, that's a long winded intro to saying, I think the real key to, to even getting started or, or getting moving towards success is figuring out where you are. And you, you can't go anywhere until you put the pieces together first and actually see your financial world um, and, and see the reality of, of, you know, what is working, what isn't working, you know, um, and doing things that I think a lot of times um, we don't do, we put off or we don't necessarily understand how to do. So something as simple as a budget, I have, I have worked with literally clients whose net worth is in the millions who have never done a budget for themselves. So it's not about how much or how little you have or what you do professionally. We're just not, nobody comes out of any schooling, even especially the School of Hard Knocks, which is probably the best teacher in this arena, right? With with an idea as to just, what are these basic building blocks that allow me to have financial success? So usually that's where I start. You know, um, if you're further along or you feel more comfortable and more confident, then great, we can, you know, I will meet you where you are, but I don't think I can ever help anybody unless we agree that we're starting in the right place. So I think, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, where do, where would I begin? The answer is let's, let's put you together financially first Mm -hmm. and agree that, that we have a good picture. And then it's about um, working on, you know, what are the things that are actually really important to you? And laying out some some you know a framework for pursuing those things because we have goals and so many we have weight loss goals we have you know work goals we have life goals it's sometimes harder I think to quantify financial goals and so I think that's the that that's the part where people feel the empowerment is after they put things together and they start to realize oh my gosh I can I can actually do something I I, I want to do but I've never tried to do. Um, you know, it, I think a lot of times you can get stuck on things like, I need to save money for retirement. What is that? What's mm-hmm. retirement to the average person? Like, it's like me saying to you, Sharif, hey, you want to go to the moon tomorrow? There's no, there's no real tangible concept for it. So let's not talk about that. Let's make it more practical, more pragmatic. It's not to say that that's not something you have to do, but to, let's, let's make it real talk, right, Allison? Make it make it real, make it practical and tangible. And then, you know, I think that people are able to take the steps um, and move forward. And, and it's different for everybody. There's definitely no magic pill. There's no one size shoe fits all. There's not a book, even though I've written a book, it's not, you know, that's not it. It's, it's, it's a process. Um, so. Yes. I love the aspect of, of real. I like real. You mentioned Allison. So I wanted to ask you, I know since you've been writing question, this column and receiving so many questions over the years, what are some of the um, questions that have stood out to you? Some of them I can't mention. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I think really is. They're on the leather and lace section, is that right? Yes. In the uh, spice section only. Yes. People want to feel validated. And what um, 
Ryan said is really true as well, that you know, when you're looking at your life, sometimes it's overwhelming. You just don't know what, because you're in it. Mm -hmm. And when someone else can break it down for you just a little bit, I mean, most of my readers are smart. They're mm -hmm. intelligent people, they've had life experience, but they're overwhelmed because they're so close to the problem, um, whether it's finance or, or relationships or whatever. And so if you can get them to step back and then kind of shove them in the right direction, they'll come to a lot of conclusions on their own and you can help them the rest of the way. And all the qu questions that you have, and this is just curious, is there a specific topic that you enjoy responding to the most? I like, I like dealing with people. So there isn't one question that I like responding to, but now I'm thinking about your, your, um, you know, your question to me, there isn't just one that stands out that I can mention. Sometimes the questions are really outrageous and you have to step back and think, uh, you know, what's going on in this person's life and how can I help them again, step back and then go forward. I mean, there was one about literally about a woman who was going to marry a man who was in jail, who had three other wives and a bunch of children, and he was abusive and he had beaten her before he went to jail. And now he's in jail and he wants a jailhouse marriage. Should she marry him? <laughs> you know, and, and my first reaction is, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Then my second reaction is, you know, maybe there's stuff going on and we need to, we can investigate that. And again, not as a psychologist, but just asking them questions like, do you want your children around this man? You know, how would you feel if he did something to your kids? Mm -hmm. You know, to get them to think about a whole picture as opposed to I'm overwhelmed and I, I can't pick my way through it. So that was one of them, one that I can say. <laughs> Interesting. I want to go over to you for a minute, Philosophy. I know you get a, quite a few questions in regards to finances. When people come to you, what is usually the number one question that you're asked? Why do I have to do my accounting? Like almost every business owner that I've encountered, except for the ones that's excited about numbers, want to try to skip their bookkeeping or their accounting. They want to try to avoid it at all costs, even to the point where if even if they can pay somebody to do it, they don't even want to be bothered with it at all. So those are just one of my most troubling um questions that i receive and it's almost every day and it's discouraging <laughs> too, honestly yes because one of the things that i find in you can correct me if i'm wrong or based on your experience is that people want to start a business because they have a passion for it like someone who loves to ride motorcycles oh i love motorcycles that means i can have a motorcycle business but they don't have the background or the you know and i always say if nothing else go take accounting courses or go hire a an accountant because you may have a passion for a business but don't understand how they don't understand how to do the back end or operating the actual business you know what that is so true and most and so that's where the problem come where i have to really convince them that your passion is reliant on you doing sufficient accounting like if you don't do your accounting you may not be able to afford to do your passion next month so right. i have to like i said Sharif, i meet the people exactly where they are because we don't understand that accounting is the language of business. You cannot communicate anything involving your business money at all without utilizing the accounting jargon, 100%. But when they feel as though that they're ready to scale the passion, that's when I notice most entrepreneurs start to take their accounting serious. And then that's where most of the problems come at and mindset breakthroughs and you know, they might even get set back and have to restart the business all over because they didn't do it properly. So it's, yeah, the county. <laughs> you mentioned scaling though. Too often what I see, and maybe it's because I have like a personal uh, opinion on this, like my father, he's been in business in California since 1985 with his own plumbing business. He does plumbing, HVAC, you know, the whole nine. But it, since 1985, it's been a one man solopreneur company 
And I always say, well, you have to get past the entrepreneur and get into the business owner because the point of all of this is to create jobs. And too often yeah. businesses don't consider that option as far as scaling. What would you say about, would you agree or disagree? I totally agree. And then honestly, Sharifa, you may be able to catch him up and let him know, you know what, that you just a high paid job. He, you have a high paying job. <laughs> so honestly, he is self-employed. Yeah, you're not really an arch. An entrepreneur is the one that starts the business, create the systems, and then they can, you know, walk away for years at a time and let go. Mm -hmm. So in his particular state, you have to really. We may have to ask him, what do he really want? Do he want this business to be able to be handed down generations? We mm -hmm. have to start asking our questions, asking our hard questions like, what do that life look like when you want to retire? Something Brian may be having to ask often. So if you want to retire and sit on the beach then we need to structure your business properly over the next 10 years and do things in a certain manner so that that's capable um but i don't think many business owners understand that it's levels to it when you come in first of all you may not be able to hire somebody so you have to be the technician but that's the start not the finish and once he becomes clear on what his vision is then we can get him to the finish line so most business owners are free to let go so that's a mindset thing so i think in all actuality what the end life look like is where i start with my clients because i have to be help them build in between and everything that we do in between well our future is predicated on everything that we do in between so I can see your passion. I can see you're you're doing what you came to this earth to do. I love your passion. <laughs> real real quick, Brian, I would love for you to comment on the aspect of scaling your business. No, it's great, and and Felicity crushed it. I and mean, the the language of business is accounting, a hundred percent. If you haven't trademarked that, do it, or I'll steal it. Um, <laughs> but, but no, it, it, it scale. So you know. Um, I had a fascinating conversation with, with another industry professional, another gentleman in Baltimore, Maryland that runs a financial practice and we were having lunch and he said to me, the way he said it was perfect. And he was talking about my industry in particular, but it has, I think, application to what we're talking about, what you just asked. And that's, there's usually really two types of professionals, entrepreneurs, what have you. There are lifestyle driven professionals where whatever you do, your, your business is really built around supporting your lifestyle. And there's nothing, you know, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that because sometimes that is more than enough and, and, and that's fine. But you have to decide if that's where you're going to be or then there's private equity style practices and businesses. And the distinguishing factor between those two is that you move away from a lifestyle to creating a business that deals with scalability, sellability, and, and you know, really is something that's built so that someone else would want to invest in it. And you, know, you wanna talk about needing to have your house in order from an accounting standpoint, from a revenue standpoint, from a marketing and business development standpoint. So two completely different types. And yet a lot of people, A, like Philosophy mentioned, don't know that they're lifestyle practitioners because they think of themselves differently. So you got to, you know, come to terms with where you are. But if you want to be that, and it doesn't mean that you're going to sell to a private equity company, but to get in the mentality of growing and, and, and building something that does live beyond you and, or, or, or you know, having some sort of a, a, a viable exit at some point in the future, that requires different tactics and i think a lot of times you know especially i mean i mean i think your dad's a great example he's clearly really good at what he does but being good at what you do as a professional you know doesn't necessarily mean you're a good business manager right or you have the desire to hire people or manage you know so that's where i think a lot of the the you know the things that we know we're not good at we then also want to avoid doing and so a lot of times it's talking through, okay, well, what kind of, if we want to go from A to B, like philosophy said, begin with the end in mind. Perfect. So if that's where you're trying to go, what are the missing building blocks? And let's be real, realistic about who should do what, because the best answer is it can't be you doing everything. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, once you, and then that's, you know, that's where, you know, I, I, one of one of the earliest professional designations I got was certified family business specialist, which is really, it's not just about family businesses, but, you know, helping businesses go through this type of a, a planning process. And, you know, again, it's not about money. Mm-hmm. This is all about the passion and the people and then creating a framework for actual growth and, and you know, building that being something that people can come work for and live on and all that kind of stuff. So, well, I love it. That was a wonderful answer. It was so great. I love your answer. I love philosophy's answer. I think that's something that we might have to continue the discussion on another show. I would love all of you to come back because I have so many more questions that I didn't have the time didn't have the time this morning to ask, but we are coming down to the last two minutes of the show. Okay, maybe four minutes since we got a little late start, but at the last few minutes of the show, what I love to do is just allow my guests to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who's watching live, as well as everyone who's watching in the archives, and really let them know briefly what you want them to take away from your appearance. And Renee, we didn't have a lot of time to give to you, but please let us know. Okay, I, I have to speak really quickly because we have four minutes. Um, what do I want them to know? Um, something that's really important to me that I've been working on is I just published my first book and I hear that I'm amongst other authors, which is so exciting. But it's Chemo Muscles, Lessons Learned from Being a Psychologist, Psycho-Oncologist in Cancer Patients. And um, I talk a lot about uh, my experience working in a pediatric cancer center and um, then becoming a cancer patient. And there's a lot of memoir in there and a lot of psychological research about coping mechanisms and healthcare providers and uh, how healthcare providers can sort of interact with us in a more effective way, um, a more humanistic way. And being that uh, the world is being so impacted by COVID, um, I think that, there's a lot in there for us. Um, It's been such a pleasure. And I will say that um, I learned a lot from a psychological perspective, listening to um, both of you talk about finances. Um, I, as a psychologist, never really thought how much uh, the emotional psychological aspect is involved in um, making financial decisions. And that's really, it was really interesting to me. Um, Thank you guys. It was really nice to be here. Where can we pick up a copy of your book? Uh, it's on Amazon or Mascot Books. And my website is drexelbert.com. I love it. Great. Philosophy, what do you have for us? Um, no, I just want everyone to just basically take away that if your desire is to live your, your life freely, you know, do your passion or have that business, then don't forget about your accounting. It's unavoidable and it's necessary. And if used right, it can help you achieve your goals. And so, no, I don't have a new book coming out or anything like that. Um, But if you guys are looking for like amazing content, don't forget to follow me on all social media. Um, My social media is Falasha Day, the accountant. And if you're curious about the PPP loans and then everything else, we have our own resource center with all of the updates and information for you to take and grow your business and get the funding that you need. Absolutely. We'll come back. We'll talk about that as well. Brian, what do you have for us? Uh, I just want everybody to know money isn't a stumbling block. It's a means to experiencing the life that you want to live. So if it's a stumbling block for you, let's change that. Um, I did recently get my book published, The Retirement Income Pyramid. Um, super excited, literally as of June 1st. So just in time for this, wow. uh, Sharif. Congratulations. Did it, did it for you. Thank you for me. I'm so, I'm, 100%. someone wrote a poem for me the other day and I put that out in the newsletter. So now love an actual it. book, like this is amazing. I feel the love. And where can we pick up a copy of your book? Get, get it on Amazon. Uh, you get the printed version or the, uh, the Kindle version. Uh, it's it's a, a brief read. You can read it probably in a day or two, uh, but I think it's great just as a retirement preparedness uh, equipper uh, for anybody. Uh, you'll you'll enjoy it. And then definitely, if you want to listen, I, I have a podcast. That's myfinancialguide.com uh, or on all the, the podcasting sites where I do stuff like this. So, yeah. So in your podcast, do you, do you answer questions? Do you give advice? Do you have guests? I usually, you, most of it is yes, um, and I get it. It's just like like we've done today, great conversations with people both in the financial world as well as some other worlds. And so uh, there's a there's a little bit of of something for everybody. And uh, so yeah, it's it, it's fun. Finances shouldn't be the uh, non-narcotic cure for insomnia. They can be fun. You know, it's cool. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love that. I have never heard that. Okay, you better uh, patent that or trademark that because Philosophy Day, she might go ahead and take that one from you. <laughs> but since uh, Allison is going to have me as a part of her column or something like that, what do I have to do to get on your podcast, Brian? Oh, just what's the scheduled time? Yeah, well, uh, I'm absolutely, I'm coming back on this. So we'll be offline scheduling it up and definitely, I, I love it. All of you, I'd, I'd love to to have as guests, so. Yes, yes we're going to make that happen. See, this is how I get all my exposure. I just bring everybody here and then I'm like, I want to be on your show, your show, your show, whatever shows. If you hear people with shows, tell them, have Sharifa Hardy on your show. I'm <laughs> rambling today. Allison. Okay. I'll make it very quick because I know we're running out of time. I hope that your listeners will know that no question is insurmountable, but sometimes it helps to ask someone else to get a little bit of more, you know, a little perspective on it. And I don't have any new books, but they are on Amazon. Um, most of them are relationship books. And you can ask me a question. Uh, we have a contact form on advicesisters.com and also on leatherandlaceadvice.com. Um, my social media, I'd love to connect with all of you and with your um, followers. And I'm Allison Blackman on Instagram and Advice Sisters everywhere else. And it's been a pleasure to be on your show. And I'm looking forward to having you, Sharifa, in my column. I'm looking forward to it as well. And now what I'm going to do is start thinking of questions that I can ask. Like, I don't have anyone to ask. So I'm just going to ask Allison. That's going to be my, my new thing. And so I just want to thank all of you for being my guest today on this episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. And I definitely have to thank everyone who tuned in to watch this show live, as well as everyone who is watching it in the archives. I truly enjoyed myself. I hope you enjoyed yourself as well. But please, I ask for your support. Go to our guest websites, check them out, follow them on social media, ask your questions, tune into their podcast, order their books, but definitely support them. And when you tweet them or inbox them or speak to them, definitely let them know. Sharifa Hardy says hi. And if you are interested in being a guest, please visit the website at AskSharifa.com. Until tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, everyone have a safe and a blessed day. Bye now.